name is Charles Chuck Swenson, um, born July 19th, 1949. Mm -hmm. Been living in Viking here now for many years. What war um, were you in and which branch of the service did you serve in? I was uh, in the Vietnam War, served in the Army. Okay. What years were those? Uh, March of 1969 until March of 1974, did five years. What was your rank? I came out as a Spec 5. Where did you serve while you were in that? <laughs> you know, believe it or not, I'm, I was ready for that because okay, in okay. five years I moved around a lot. You okay. forced me to go back and dig into some old records. Oh good. Okay, I started out basic in AIT at Fort Lewis, Washington, and I got sent over to Vietnam. Um, I was there for a couple of months, mm -hmm. and then I spent like five weeks in the hospital in Japan, and two, three months in the hospital in Denver, mm -hmm. and down to Fort Hood, Texas, and from there over to Fort Bliss, Texas. Then I did a 10-month stint in the hospital there, mm -hmm. and from there it was back to Fort Hood, Texas, and two or three different units there, and uh, I ended up at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Okay, well, we'll, we'll I, cover, I covered a lot of ground we'll, in five years, yeah, yes. We'll, we'll learn all about that here in this interview then. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. How did you feel when you found out that you were going? Oh, to Vietnam? Mm-hmm. I don't know, it's just, that was just part of life in those days. I mean, you got the call and you went. Where were you living at the time? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, we were in transit. Okay. See, I was married in September of 68. And my wife and I had moved to California. Mm -hmm. And about Christmas or right at Christmas time, then we decided California was not for us. Mm -hmm. So we were coming home and, and going to get settled in and got home and the draft notice finally caught up to it as we got here. So we really weren't living anywhere when I got the notice. So then we had to make plans because my wife had to have some place to be because I was not going to be here for a while. Did you know how many, how long you were going to be gone when you were drafted? Did, did they tell you how long you would be gone? Well, at that time, um, normal draftee would spend two years in the Army. So did you get to pick the branch of the service that you joined or did they choose for you? I guess they more or less chose for me. Um, what were your first days like in the service? <laughs> uh, the first days, mm -hmm. well, you get into the induction center and they give you the green clothes and cut all your hair off and yell at you a lot and it wasn't real pleasant. Mm -hmm. You know, you go from being sort of footloose, fancy free farm boy into people yelling at you and telling you what to do all the time. Yeah, it, it, it took a whole lot of getting used to. Mm -hmm. Did you um, know anyone in the service when you went there? Were any of your friends drafted at the same time? When I left home here, it was just, just me. I didn't really know anybody else who was going in. Mm -hmm. We got on a train in Fargo, North Dakota, and by the time we got out to Fort Lewis, Washington, I had made several friends. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about your boot camp training experience. Boot camp. Mm -hmm. Well, the basic training was basic training. You, you walked, you carried, you physical, you know, PT all the time and people yelling at you and mm -hmm. It wasn't real pleasant. That yeah. kind of drifted off. How did you get through those cha those initial challenges? Well, I made some I made some good friends, and mm -hmm. hey, we we were there. It had to be done, and, and mm -hmm. we just did it. That was immediately after the basic. Okay, so what did you do while you were there? In the AIT, yeah. well, by then we were starting to become soldiers in a way, and uh -huh. bonded some good friends, good friendships then. And uh, we could get out on the weekends. My wife came out and stayed with my cousins out near Fort Lewis then for the eight weeks of advanced training. Mm -hmm. And on the weekends, we could get a pass and go down there and mm -hmm. have a really good time. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. You know how it is when you, you're young. Well, see, like that time I would have been. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, advanced training. Uh, March, okay, April, May was basic training. June and July was uh, the advanced training. And, and I, where was the advanced training again? At Fort Lewis, Washington. Fort yeah, Lewis, we, Washington. we just okay. kind of moved across the street. Okay. You know, the old World War II barracks. Mm -hmm. There was not real high class living there, but mm -hmm. hey, it was a building. Mm -hmm. It didn't rain on us. So. Mm -hmm. They worked you hard enough where you would eat just about anything. Okay. Never did like tomatoes, still don't like tomatoes, but there was one day when all we had for a meal was stewed tomatoes. I did eat the damn things. You get put on KP and you'd steal, uh, you know, working in the kitchen, you'd grab two, three slices of bread if you'd get your hands on it just for a little something extra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it rained. Oh my God, we just about wore out a set of rain gear because it would start raining. Washington, in that time of the year, is the rainy season. Mm -hmm. And about the time you got soaked right to the skin, put on your rain gear. So we put it on. Quit raining in about five minutes. You'd wear that until you about sweat to death, and then you take it off. The minute you got to put away, it would start raining again. There were some days, I swear to God, yeah, you could just about wear out a set of rain gear in one day. When did you find out that you were going to be heading over to Vietnam? Then? Like, uh, that was like right at the... The last days of the advanced training. We, you know, graduation thing, you get your orders, and it said Vietnam on it. So you come home for a few days and try to get everything tucked away and find some place for my wife to live and take care of all the things at home and back on the plane and away you go. How did you get over to Vietnam? In a big yellow airplane. Braniff Airlines had the ugliest yellow airplane I have ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> was it a, was no, it, a no, it was a big yeah. uh, commercial type airplane. I mean, it, it was that, but I remember that thing was yellow. It was, I think it was the first yellow airplane I had ever seen. It was ugly. And it was going someplace. It was kind of ugly too. Where in Vietnam were you? I was down in, around Cu Chi, in Tainan province. Okay. We were just, just off the Cambodian border when we hit our landmine. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I wasn't there very long. Oh, okay. Do you remember arriving and what that was like? Oh, yeah. It was hot and it stunk. That whole country stinks. I mean, it just stinks. Like, like what? Like shit. Oh. <laughs> like, yeah, well, like that's a, that, that, yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> kind of like, only it's, you know, a lot of you, I mean, they, didn't waste anything, all manure of any kind from any source mm -hmm. was used in the rice paddies, you know, for fertilizer. Mm -hmm. They didn't have fertilizer spreaders over there, everything's done by hand. Mm -hmm. It was a really weird place though, because you'd ride through the, the small villages on, on the tracks and you'd look through the windows and I mean, it just, a tar paper shack would be an improvement for the housing they had. Mm -hmm. And you look inside and there'd be a dozen people all hunched up in the corner watching a TV. This is really strange. I mean, they ain't got chairs to sit on, but they got a TV in the corner that they can watch. Yeah, it, it was weird. What was your assignment in Vietnam? What were you doing? I was uh, assigned to a mechanized infantry unit. We had tracks that we would ride on. Okay. I was just digging in. All pictures of the old Phantom 3-4 here. There, that is an M113A1 track vehicle. And that's that's how we got around mostly. Okay. Of course, at night, then you had to go out on an ambush. You'd ride the track to the edge of some place. Then you'd walk way back into the wherever, a rice paddy, a jungle, along the road somewhere, and then you'd sleep in the rain all night. And, or try, you know, stay awake, sleep, whatever. Oh, yeah, I don't know, I don't even remember what we were supposed to be doing, there, but one day we uh, came across an old deserted sugar factory mill, plantation, something, I don't know, it must have been an old sh sugar cane mill or something. It was an abandoned building, but we were walking around, we went inside and looked, and there was a shower room, and we turned the knobs, and water came out of a pipe on the wall. Hold my gear and, yeah, 
take turns. Every, we actually had a nice warm shower in a building, water coming out of a pipe, but clean water. It was really, really nice. Because otherwise, I mean, in the morning, you would take a five gallon black plastic can, fill it with water, set it up on top of the track, go out and walk all day in the heat, come back in the, in the afternoon, and you know, at 110 degrees of water in that can got pretty warm, so you cracked a little spigot, you had that little drip of water coming out of that can, and that was your shower. Oh. And it felt really good. <laughs> it was just kind of the way it was. Oh um. yes, and then, the, okay, one, well, we got stuck several times, but, yeah, being mechanized unit, we would mount, uh, we would uh, do a mounted riff, they called it, a recon in force, where we, the tracks would line up side by side and we would go through the rubber plantations, you know, looking for people that weren't supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was soft, it was getting into the rainy season and we got stuck. And it wouldn't come out and you couldn't get any tracks in close enough to get us out so they decided they're going to call it one of these big helicopters to just pick us right out of the mud. Mm -hmm. Well, there's trees in the way, so we had to take down the trees. Being, you know, you talk about a bunch of 19 year, 19, 20 year old kids with way too much explosives. <laughs> we took like five times as much C4 as we needed, put on this poor little tree, tied it on to really good with depth cord, which would have been all we needed in the first place. We stuck a blasting cap in there, lit the fuse, and went poof, we just blew a little hole in this. C4 is relatively stable. And we did this two or three times. And we finally went and got to the electric discharge blasting cap, put that in there, and set that off. And when that went off, that poor little tree went so high in the air you couldn't see it. And there was toothpicks falling for a long ways around and everybody duck and cover, you know. That was that was fun. Of course then we had to set up for the night because the chopper come in, they couldn't pick the track out anyway. So now you're trying to create a, a little perimeter around this track that's stuck in the mud out in the middle of nowhere and keep people away from it all night. So you stay awake all night and in the morning then they come with the big tank retrievers and smaller units and they'd run one out as far as he could get and put a cable on us and then they'd run another one and run all his cable out and it finally went back to a very large tank retriever sitting up on a dry chunk of road. And when he hit the uh, winch, everything came with it. Every, just pulled it all out. What does the tank retriever look like? A tank like? retriever looks a lot like a tank. It's about that size, a little bigger. It's got blades you can set down. It's got big winches and yes, it's, yeah, it, it's big enough to kind of like a tow truck for tanks. Mm -hmm. So you can about imagine the size of those things. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed, mm -hmm. I'm very impressed, mm -hmm. yes. All right. And we did get stuck another time in a rubber plantation. And we were driving on these rubber trees that Uncle Sam was paying like $1,700 a piece for, trying to keep the track up so we wouldn't get stuck. And we finally went stuck anyway with one of these rubber trees right up against the nose of that track. You can't move it. You can't get anybody in there to pull you out. We have to move that tree. But the good Lord provided us with a real engineer that knew how to use explosives. He sent a charge, he blew that tree out from under there without hurting anything. Mm -hmm. And then we got up and there fight. And running these mounted rifts through the jungle, um, fire ants would build nests in the, some of the trees. And so you get running through there, your four or five tracks wide, and everybody's rolling along. And you touch one of those trees and knock one of those nests down. Uh, we were going one day and all we heard on the radio was, fire ants and stop, look left, look right. And you could tell who it was immediately because everybody on that track was off of the track. You always rode on top. You never rode inside of those things because that was like a coffin. You ride on top. That's why I'm still here because we rode on top. Um, but yeah, everybody on the track off and stripped naked and these big red fire ants just eat you right to the bone in a heartbeat. I mean, they were they were vicious. You didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, if uh, the track driver is pretty important, don't hit the tree. Don't hit the tree. Don't knock one of those nests down on top of you. Uh-uh. Not a good deal. But the mosquitoes over there, oh God, you think we have mosquitoes here? Not a chance. Them over there was huge. 
and every bite you got would turn into a sore. I mean, you hit and you scratch it once, and not in human all the time. So everything, you know, would fester and infect. And yeah, every mosquito bite would be the size of a quarter or a half dollar. Just yeah, you covered with them all the time. It did was, you have to take anything for like malaria or anything like oh, that? Oh, I'm sure we did. They gave, yeah, every time you turned around, they were giving you a shot or a pill or something of some kind of trying, trying to keep you well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, did you see combat? Did I see combat? Personally, well, I never shot at anybody. Mm -hmm. I never got shot at. Mm -hmm. I did get blown up. Do you want to explain what happened? Yeah. Okay. Well, well one night, the mm -hmm. fire base that we were at, I had been called out on a an ambush patrol that night, so we were off maybe a half a mile or something from the fire base, and there was rounds sent into that fire base, and our job was to watch that road, so we just sat there and watched a few rounds go in and out, it was not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But then, let's see, I arrived there well, like the 28th of August or something, on the 23rd of October, we were just a routine day, we were, we were sweeping the road for mines. That was kind of standard procedure. You, the engineers would walk out front with their mine sweepers, you know, metal detectors, okay. and sweep the road, make sure there was no mines in it. And we got swept all the way out to the next road where somebody else had taken over. And we turned around, we were coming back to the fire base, and the track driver, mm -hmm. instead of going around the mud hole where we had swept it for safety, went through the mud hole and they estimated that landmine at about 100 pounds of explosives. That track was heavy and it was loaded to the hilt. Mm -hmm. And that went off, it was so loud, I didn't, I can't say that I heard it. All I remember is looking down at some very tall trees and all the stuff that had been on top of that track was just hanging in the air. The only thought that went through my head was, I wonder how much of that stuff is going to fall on me when I get back to the ground. But I was, I was really, really, really lucky. I hit the ground, nothing landed on top of me. I was dropped into a little mud hole. My feet were kind of, it's almost like a small bathtub. At noon over there, the water was warm because it wasn't real deep. I had a little scratch on my hand and it broke my back. Oh my. Yes. So, after being injured like that, um, how were you removed from that area, and where did Medivac. you go next? Okay. Um, it didn't take long. Med our, we had a fantastic medic. Those guys were out there just about immediately. The medic was checking on everybody. I was probably in, I would say, better condition. The squad leader come over, and he was cut from here to here, bleeding like a stuck hog, and asked me how I am, and I. Well, I I think I'm okay. I don't know. I can't move, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, pretty soon the chopper started coming in and he drug me. There wasn't room for a, my litter on the chopper. They just grabbed me by the shirt collar and drug me in, laid me on top of some lifting straps or something. So I was laying there all twisted up, and that's like chuck, 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 my first helicopter ride. Oh. So were you in a lot of pain at that point? Oh, there was. Major discomfort, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it got better. When they got us over to the hospital, or field hospital, whatever, and they off the chopper and inside and dropped me on an ice cold x ray table. It was like laying on a block of ice. You know, it's 105, 110 degrees outside. They bring you into a 70 degree room, and this table is, you know, maybe 60. Yeah. <laughs> that was cold. I just won't come off of that. And it took some extra reason. Yeah. So did you have surgery there? Oh, that gets to be another long story. Okay. Because, well, I spent a week there in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then they shipped me over to Japan. I laid there in that hospital for about five weeks. And then I came back to Fitzsimmons General in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I was there for about three months. And they sent me back to active duty. Mm, okay. So bed rest is what I got for my broken back at that time. So that was you, it. You had no surgery, no medical care other than just then the, resting. And then this plot thickens. They sent me to Fort Hood, and this was in. Let's see. I put my timeline together here so I wouldn't forget. Let's mm -hmm. see. Uh, okay, February 
of 70, I uh, went to Fort Hood. And then in, I was there for about a month, and that's when I re-enlisted for something different. I took a four-year burst. I was going to be a launcher crewman on a Nike Hercules missile. They had a base at Fort Snelling, right in Minneapolis, guaranteed duty station. You take four years, they'll send you to school, you go to go there and serve out your four years in, Min in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And it sounded like a pretty good idea to this young gentleman. Mm -hmm. So we packed up and headed over to Fort Bliss, Texas for training. Well, then the silly fools put me on KP. I wasn't a big fan of KP, so I went on sick call. Well, that was the best thing I ever did, because I got over there, the doctors took a look at me and says, you're having surgery. I says, no, 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 I, I'm gonna wait until I get to, Min get to Minnesota for that. Says, All you have to do is drive over a railroad track wrong, step wrong, and you will be paralyzed from the waist down. And I said, really? My wife was there with me at the time, and I went back to our place, and we discussed it a little bit, and I went back in there, and I said, you're right, we will have the surgery. Mm -hmm. So 10 months later, I got out of there. <laughs> so you were in the hospital for 10 months recovering from that surgery? Well, it was, okay. Let's do here. Eight weeks in a circle electric bed without moving. I mean, my feet didn't touch the floor for eight weeks. This is the way they used to do things. Nowadays, they put two screws in your back and you're up the next day. Then, El Paso, Texas, in the fall, the heat of the year, they carried the back brace, or the, the cast, body caster out for another eight weeks. Then I got out of that, then they put me in a, a jewet brace that you could strap on and take on and off and stuff and carried that for a few months and yeah, it was June, first part of June when I went into the hospital and it was, uh, I think, Mar uh, May, okay, yeah, it was like in March of the next year then. So it was all of June all the way to middle of March the next year before I got out of there. From there they sent me back to Fort Hood, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I was in and out of that place and I was different things. I ended up in a, uh, because I had supposedly trained as a launcher crewman, they sent me to an artillery battalion uh, on its John missiles and I ended up in fire direction control. Some of the first this is my first encounter with the computer. Mm -hmm. Fadak, Fre Freddy Fadak, yeah. really big monstrous 400 volt weird looking thing to calculate the trajectory of a missile. And what For, year was this again? So uh, that would have been in 1971. Okay. So we, we our, our group um, would get you know, our position, the position of the launcher, the position of the target. We'd have to take temperatures, barometric pressures. You do logarithms on the different numbers to calculate the trajectory of this this uh, missile. And it all had to be hand calculated. We had two guys doing hand calculations and one guy on the computer. Everybody checking against everybody. When all three come up the same, we would send that information to the launcher and they would send this thing out. So what was that computer called again? That was uh, FADAC. We called it Freddy. <laughs> Freddy FADAC. Field Artillery Data Acquisition Computer. Okay. Those little red glowing bulbs <laughs> in there with the numbers in it and stuff. Oh yeah, that was, that was kind of cool. Wow. Um, so how long were you there doing uh, that? Oh, let's see. I was with that in that fire direction control for a while. Then the company clerk left, so they made a clerk out of me. Then a little while after that, then they needed somebody to go over to division headquarters to compete on a pistol team. Yes, and because everybody else was busy and I was just sitting there, you know, some of my nose anyway, I went over to shoot pistol. Well, that lasted for several months. I got pretty good at it. Yes, I, I got a trophy someplace around home there from 
shooting the 45 caliber, you know, 19, yeah. And that was an art, and like then, a mili uh, military thing related. Oh yeah, this is, yeah what, the military has their pistol teams from here and there, and they go here and there. And, mm -hmm. and I was doing quite well, and we got into the middle of the winter, and it got cold, so we went inside to shoot 22s, and I started limp farming, and my shooting abilities fell off a little bit. So hey, you're a clerk. We need a clerk here. Mm -hmm. So then everybody else was running all over the country shooting pistols, and I got to stay there and fill out the travel orders for them and things like that and just kind of walk around wearing my special cool advanced marksmanship unit get up and yeah it was that was that was kind of nice mm -hmm. yeah so so what did you end up doing after that what came next uh, let's see from there oh the unit that i was assigned to when i went out to do this pistol thing got closed out mm -hmm. so they sent me over to another unit mm -hmm. well at that point in time they said well You've been in the States long enough, now it's time to send you someplace else. We're going to send you to Germany. Well, being a company clerk, I had a lot of time to sit in the office. I read the, the Army regulations in my spare time. So I started digging. And I went down and I said, no, you can't do that. Why not? Because you're going to send me in this, in this uh, launcher crewman MOS, and I'm not qualified. I, I, I shouldn't have that. And I started throwing army rigs at these officers that are sitting there like, you know, and they did some digging and says, well, I guess you're right. We, we can't do that. Good. So we're going to send you to school and give you a new MLS. We'll give you a new job specialty. Well, then we packed up and went to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey for a few weeks and learned how to repair movie projectors. Yeah, so I got there and I learned how to be a projector repairman. Did pretty good at it. And I got down there and he says, there, now we're going to send you to Germany. And I said, well, I really don't want to go. So I went home on my leave before I was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And instead of flying to Fort Dix, New Jersey for transfer to Germany, I flew into Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I went to the big five-sided building. Mm -hmm. And I went to the bitch department mm -hmm. and sat there most of the day before I got a hold of somebody. And I sat down in front of him and we had a little chat mm -hmm. about what had happened, what the history was, mm -hmm. how things shouldn't be the way they are and all these other things and he kind of sort of agreed with me. I must have had my puppy dog eyes on or something. I don't know, look kind of sad. Well, he says, you know, you're right. Things just ain't quite the way they should be. So because of your medical history, we, I got two options for you. You can either go back to Fort Hood. They have a good, good hospital there or you can go to Walter Reed. I says, well, I've been in Fort Hood. I've never been to Walter Reed, so let's send me there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they did. <laughs> so then I got transferred into Walter Reed. I got there and I worked uh, doing, taking in work orders on all the equipment. I mean, that shop fixed everything from a bed lamp to heart monitors, defibrillators, you name it. If it was at Walter Reed, we fixed it, and you had to bring this stuff in. And that went for a while, and then the guy in supply bought the parts for all this stuff was leaving, so I got moved in there. Mm -hmm. So I got moved in there, and I would order parts out of Japan from all over the world while well, we had a Photoshop. You could order camera parts one day, and you'd be ordering a part monitor parts the next day, and then you'd be buying plug-ins for, and we had a TV shop, all the TVs in the hospital. Well, those days TVs, worked what they are today, they, they broke a lot. And so you could buy a tube for a TV and a part for a camera and you call Japan and try to talk to one of those people to order a little screw for a lens on a Gishika model, blah, blah. Very interesting, very interesting. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And prior to my ETS then, they let me work 
in the TV shop because I had this projector repair or amplifier history and mm -hmm. so I got to work at, in the TV shop then before I got out. Mm -hmm. okay. Which kind of led into working at a Radio Shack later and from there it was, I got introduced into computers, I got to work out the pipe, got to work in the pipeline, got a job there and they were just starting automation and so for the next 25 years I lived out of a suitcase working with computers on the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple, huh? <laughs> Interesting? Yeah, so yeah. It, it all goes way back to, you know, that first computer at the, uh, in the fire direction control way back at Fort Hood, Texas in 1971. And then it slowly but surely progressed through the electronic side and into the computers and the, and the company clerking thing, uh, typing was, came in real handy. I got to be a clerk here and clerk there and you'd have time to read this and that. And, so it all came together. I do not regret any of the five years that I spent in the service because mm -hmm. I learned so much mm -hmm. without even knowing that I was learning. Mm -hmm. so, so was your time at Walter Reed the last thing that you did? That was the last place I was. I was there for about a year and a half. That was the longest I was okay. anywhere. Was your wife there with you? Yes. Was she able to? Okay. Yes. okay. We had one child, One our oldest child was born in Fort Hood, Texas at uh -huh. Darnell Army Medical there. And the, our daughter was born at Walter Reed and then our third child was born over Grand Forks after we finally got out of the service. So, okay. yeah, they're kind of scattered out. In the... Okay, so what was it like um, living with your family out there and then also like being involved with the, with the service? I mean, what was that like for you? And did you know other families that were kind oh, of doing the same thing? Oh, I tell you what, you, you, you could make friends pretty quick because mm -hmm. everybody was in. Actually, at one point, um, Fort Hood, uh, one of my old drill sergeants from basic training had gotten out of the service and tried being a civilian for a while and didn't work, came back into service, and he was stationed down there next to us. We were very good friends. We'd get together and play cards. And, you know, it's kind of a little bit strange, you know, your old drill sergeant, the big yell at you guy, Raymond Pickle. Like we called him Drill Pickle. <laughs> but he a really nice guy. I think he was from Kansas or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Was there anything else that just really stuck out at you um, that you'll never forget? Well, I will say that the Army taught me how to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hear a lot of this other stuff and it's, I kind of feel like I'm a little bit backwards. I just learned how to depend on me. Mm -hmm because if it wouldn't have been for me, I would have been railroaded here and there and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. I did learn that from it, instead of being the, this real tight little unit thing, but I never really was anywhere long enough to get too tight mm -hmm. with anybody mm -hmm. because I was steady on the move. Mm -hmm. moved a lot of times. I had a couple of the guys get a hold of me and they, they, they both died now. Mm -hmm. were, um, there is one one uh, sergeant, well, back from my fire direction days, uh, lives up in Maine. We've been out to see them once, and he keeps saying he's going to come here, but he hasn't made it yet. Uh, but yeah, we still stay in touch with him, but that's actually about the only one. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Joey Tulevoski out of Argyle. We went to basic and AIT together, and he comes in here for dumplings regular, so yes, I do stay in touch with him. How do people entertain themselves? <laughs> um, oh, Vietnam? Yeah. Well, alcohol was good. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, one, his name was Charlie, Charlie what, I don't know, but he always had an ammo can with him and nobody was allowed to look in there because it was full of grass. He was a pretty, pretty happy-go-lucky guy, yeah. There was, uh, th there was a lot of that. You'd get into the fire bases at night, you could go around, you had your, your country music coming out of this hooch, you had your rap music coming out of this hooch, you had soul music coming out of this hooch, yeah, it, it, everybody kind of grouped into their own little groups and cliques and, yeah. They, what did you do while you were on leave? What, were you in Vietnam before your injury long enough to go on leave of any sort? Well, let's see, I got 30 days leave before we went to Vietnam. And when I got back out of the hospital, I had a convalescent leave. And then you get down and I got reenlistment, I got to leave out of the reenlistment. And that was in another hospital, I got 
uh, convalescent leaves from there. I had another surgery while I was out there and I got a convalescent leave out of that. Then you had your, I was home a lot. A lot of convalescent leaves mm -hmm. because I was in and out of hospitals. There was, yeah, a couple other in and outs there that I think I just kind of forgot about it. So did you do anything um, enjoyable while you were home or was it mostly recovering from your oh. hospital stays? When you come home, you come home to the farm, you know. Yeah. Um, no, it was just, it was just, you know, you, you were just home. Yeah. Like, folks had a farm and you would come home and you would help milk the cows and put up the hay or do the harvest and mm -hmm. do all this and that and see a few friends and yeah, and pretty soon the leave is over and back you go again. Yeah. After you got out of the service, what were your days and weeks like immediately after that? And out of the service, we came home and stayed with my parents for a while, started right into cow milking farming and uh, bought a place um, like two miles from my folks. And so uh, it was just get right to work. Mm -hmm. uh, you come back to the farm, you, there's always something that's got to be done. So you just got into it and did it. Yeah. Trying to put food on the table for the family. And, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Did you join any veterans organizations? After I you am home? a life member of the VFW Post and Keith River. I'm a life member of the DAV. Um, uh, Military Order of the Purple Heart. Life member there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how did your service and your experiences affect your life? Great. They built my life because of what I learned in the service. It made me a lot more self reliant and independent, and had figured out kind of how to get things done and make things go my own way. No, I, I do not regret any of it. Whether I was laying in a hospital bed or being chewed out by somebody or whatever, but no, I, uh, I don't regret any of it. I'm a firm believer in the fact that everybody that gets out of high school should go for two years of military service, period, end of story, I don't care what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's where you learn how to become an adult, take care of yourself, take care of others. It's invaluable training. Mm -hmm.